We're going to start with uh, Francisco de Robertis. Um, he's the founding partner of Medici Ventures, a brand new venture capital firm. Uh, prior to that, he was a partner at another VC called Index Ventures and led that firm's efforts to establish its life sciences practices. He also spearheaded the launch of their $200 million life sciences fund in partnership with GlaxoSmithKline and Johnson Johnson to invest in early stage biotechnologies. He also has a PhD in molecular biology and an undergrad in genetics. So. Uh, if you have slides or anything, do any of you guys have? Okay, perfect. We can stay here. Excellent. We don't have slides. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really exciting to be here in front of an audience of very brilliant. Obviously, from the first session, it was clear that a lot of questions came up. So I would really limit my, my introduction to just a few minutes to leave as much time as possible uh, for questions. Um, so as Matthew was saying, my name is Francesco De Robertis. Uh, I'm running Medici Ventures. Now, Medici Ventures is a brand new firm in terms of name, uh, but actually it's the rebranding of Index Ventures, which is uh, Index Ventures Life Sciences, which is the venture firm that uh, we started 20 years ago. So I'm, I'm very old. Uh, 20 years ago, we started Index Ventures uh, with two focuses, uh, information technology and life sciences. And I've been running the life sciences part of the business for the last 20 years. And earlier this year, we decided to rebrand the life sciences part into Medici Ventures, which is indeed a brand new company. Um, but at the same time, the funds, operations, team, uh, access, network, and knowledge is the one that we have developed over the last 20 years. Um, just very briefly, um, in terms of focus of Medici uh, Ventures, uh, so we are a venture capital firm mostly focused in Europe. 80% of our capital um, is really allocated in, in Europe. Um, not for any other reasons other than we really believe in the proximity of venture capitalists to, to the entrepreneurs that are being backed. Cash is, of course, one of the tools that venture capital firms use to help uh, the development of a young startup, but it's really by far uh, not the most important one. The most important one is really the know-how and lessons learned that we have learned on our skins over the last 20 years to really make sure that we can share those lessons with you know, first-time entrepreneurs or even second-time entrepreneurs. Clearly. Um, you know, the experiences uh, that we have um, uh, uh, had over the last several years uh, needs to be uh, put at work. Uh, it would be really stupid to make the same mistakes over and over again. So proximity is really very important for us. Uh, Europe is 80%, 90% of our capital. And in terms of business models and focus, we really are focused on um, pharmaceutical um, preclinical stage kind of molecules. So we invest in what is called early stage from a certain standpoint. So we invest in molecules or in companies that have got molecules uh, before they enter into the clinics. So preclinical, late discovery stage, late, late research stage, early preclinical stage, that is really the sweet spot of our focus. And the other key determinant of our approach uh, is really that we try to work in very close connection with pharmaceutical companies because in the end, we all know we are not naive enough now after 20 years to know that the very last mile of pharmaceutical development needs to be taken care of by the large pharmaceutical companies that have got implementation machines which are very well structured, very well assembled, very powerful from a financial, economic, and knowledge standpoint. So we really have decided to focus our business model with a very tight collaboration model with pharmaceutical companies, which is why also uh, GSK, uh, Johnson & Johnson are very tight partners for us and we'll be announcing soon a third pharmaceutical company that will become a key strategic partner of ours. Um, I would say, um, in terms of presentation uh, for Medici, I would really leave it to this and would be very, very keen and eager to, to, to have discussions afterwards. Excellent, thank you. Our, our next panelist uh, is actually a, it's a perfect transition. Uh, Deborah Harland, uh, she's a partner at SR1 and established the European Investment Office. She's also a part of GSK's worldwide business development team where she's responsible for sourcing and evaluating in licensing opportunities. She also has a PhD in pharmacology and an MBA. So straddles nicely this balance between strategic investment in pharma. So thank you very take it away. much. And thanks everybody again for the invitation. Um, my name is Deborah Harland, as you've heard. I, w I joined SR1, the uh, corporate venture capital fund of GlaxoSmithKline, about 10 years ago. Now, just to perhaps set a little bit of a scene to help um, understand it, what a corporate venture capital firm looks like and does. So many pharma or biotech companies have some form of captive fund where they invest some money that's given to them by the corporate parent, and SR1 is one of those. 
and it's probably one of the oldest. We've been going since 1985 in one form or another. Originally started off with some money given to the fund by Smith Klein Beecham from the sales of one of its drugs called Tagamet. And there are various models about the way they work. Some um, corporate venture funds in healthcare and life sciences are purely uh, there for financial return, and SR1 is one of those. Um, others like that are the Roche funds and the Novartis funds. Some have an investment strategy which is driven by direct strategic interests in alignment with their R&D organisation. And an example of that, I think a good one is Johnson Johnson, another one is AbbVie. Some others have a strategic um, remit, but they like to invest in what they call white space, which is areas of science and medicine that their parent is not um, prosecuting themselves in their own organisation. And some others, um, some uh, venture groups are part of a foundation, if you like. Some private companies are owned by foundations, so Novo and Lundbeck. They have a big foundation on top of the organisation, and they have funds which invest some of the foundation's money. So there's slightly different colours of corporate venture capital in uh, healthcare and life sciences. I think um, another thing that's a little bit different uh, about some of the funds compared to a fund like Medici is that a lot of the corporate venture funds are structured in what we call an evergreen way. We might get onto that a little bit later, which essentially means we recycle money. So we'll invest money, and when we get a return on our money and, and some money comes back to us, we reinvest it. So we're not investing, though we're investing for fixed times in companies until we get a return on our money, we recycle the money in so we don't have a fixed period of a fund. And that's particularly advantageous for when you are investing in early science, for instance, and you've got time uh, to see that early science grow and gain value and hopefully turn into a product or products which are going to become medicines, which is what the industry is interested in. Um, so that leads me very nicely into what our focus is. Our focus at SR1 is early innovative science. We invest in products and people uh, that can change the face of medicine and how patients are treated. Um, the fund is primarily a US fund. It's a dollar-denominated fund, but we invest about a third of our money here in Europe so about 75 to 80% US, 25 to 30% Europe. Um, we have 10 of us investing um, offices in San Francisco, Boston, Philadelphia, and London. And really, we're not investing, as I said, I think an important thing, and um, perhaps a part of the discussion, we were not investing really to fill GlaxoSmithKline's pipeline. It has other ways that it can do that. And one of the ways is, as an investor, perhaps, in Medici's fund. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, come to that. we'll come to that. But it can make investments itself. So a little bit different, but we all work together. Um, in fact, the first investment that I made with uh, when I joined SR1 was in a company that Francesco was also invested in. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist here is uh, Alan Barrow, and he started his professional life in uh, laboratory medicine, specializing in hematology, and then migrated into business, working for Baxter Healthcare for 17 years. He's been the CEO and chairman of several private and public companies, spent six years as the managing partner of Cambridge Gateway Fund, and co-authored the book, Show Me the Money, How to Raise the Cash to Get Your Business Off the Ground. He's currently the entrepreneur in residence at the Center for Entrepreneurial <laughs> Learning. Excellent, good plug. See? Um, uh, Instead of entrepreneurial learning uh, at the Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge, and the chairman of Eagle Genomics and trustee of the Cambridge Rare Disease Network. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I had the advantage over my fellow speakers. I met all you guys last night, and we had some fun, didn't we? Uh, 42 nations represented here. Isn't that wonderful? It's amazing. Amazing. And I've had such a great morning listening to those presentations. Wow. I have to go away and read a lot. Uh, I want to go back to a few basics here because, uh, as Matthew said, there you are, you're, you've got this amazing idea that's going to change the world. And I know you do because I'm, I'm one of those that have been judging the presentation that some of you are going to make at the end of all of this. 
And where do you go from there? I mean, you all know, if you're researchers, that research has a pathway, doesn't it? From idea to something that is really much more developed in the lab, but it's ready to get outside. And all of that is scientific stuff. But what I would say to you, and I've been asked this question, why is having a funding strategy important? How can a postgrad with a great idea identify a suitable funding strategy? And my suggestion to you is you have to be very thorough in understanding, with help, you don't have to do it all yourself, don't try and become the finance director. That will probably be a disaster. <laughs> Find someone who understands the numbers. But think about the long-term plan for funding what you want to do. Don't just go to me as a business angel and say, we need 250,000. And I say, how long will that last? And you say, well, probably a year. And I say, how much will you need after that? And you say, we're not sure yet. You won't get my 250,000. <laughs> so understand the longer term cash requirement of whatever business you're going to form. And then have a close look at the different sources of finance that are available to you. And amongst those is your own money. You can squander that on anything you like. There are family, friends, and fools who might invest in your company, and they do. By the way, if they are family, don't just take the money without a legal agreement on what you're going to do with it. And in case dear old auntie who gives you the money suddenly gets Alzheimer's and she can't sign legal agreements, and your next stage of funding is not an easy one to handle. So think about that. Think about the complete supply chain. So you've got your own, you've got family, friends, and fools. In this country and elsewhere uh, around the world, there are a lot of grants available that are non-equity. They don't want to take your equity. Be careful. Only go for grant funding if it fits your business model. And you really need a very, very good, clear business model and identity like we said last night. And you need to be able to present that with passion and vision to people who will generally be properly skeptical about whether they should put money into your business. So there are grants where they are appropriate. Too many go for grants, too many people go for grants just because the money's there. It doesn't work. It can be very onerous. You should have grants if they really fit what you want to do. Then you have the business angels. Never quite sure why we're called angels. You know, we don't have wings. And uh, we don't invest because we just love you, but we want to see the money take a return. So business angels can be very helpful, and they can bring you uh, advice and help. More sources of funds, they can bring you customers. And when it comes to this dreadful word exit, terrible word, isn't it? But all investors want to find a return, and that means at some point in time you're probably going to find the company will go to a market or you will sell it. So the business angels, and then you've heard something about the corporates and the venture capital people. And get to know how they operate. You're learning a lot about it today, but there's a lot more to learn. And each VC and each corporate have their own investment criteria. You have to learn that. Find out what the partners think and how they like to see a company present. When you present, don't just go in with a 30-slide PowerPoint. Talk to the investors and find out how they like to be presented to. You can do it. You can do it. You can advise, get advice from other people. So that's just a very, very quick run-through because we've got just a few minutes and we want you to then ask questions. Now, what about alternative finance? Wow. Alternative finance, the internet and entrepreneurial spirit has meant that we can get money without banks, without VCs, without the usual rigmarole. It isn't easy to get it, but it's there. So alternative finance, and I haven't got time to go through it all, I've got some wonderful reports here all about alternative finance. By alternative finance, we mean online lending, we mean crowdfunding, which can be either for a donation, for research, or a good cause. It can be for a reward. You put money on a platform and you get a reward. The games industry works this way very well. You put your money on the platform and you get the game at a concessionary price before anyone else. I don't think reward crowdfunding works so well in biosciences. I haven't seen it. 
But equity crowdfunding, where you're going onto a platform and people are buying shares with other shareholders in your company, is growing fast. Last year in the UK, the alternative uh, investment market was 3.2 billion pounds, euros, pounds, pounds, pounds. Get my currency about mixed up. Uh, mm, about the same. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so equity crowdfunding is really growing very, very fast. And in some parts of the world, it's well regulated. In other parts of the world, it isn't. Be careful if you're in China, because things are not going so brilliantly there on, on the way that the, the alternative finance is regulated. But there is one um, company now in Spain that is doing equity crowdfunding only for bioscience. People said it would never be done. It is being done. And it's being done quite successfully. <coughs> So alternative finance uh, is there. You could explore it. There's a whole chapter on it in the book that I just showed you. And think about the whole picture, as I've said. Think about the supply chain of money. Think about the different sources of money. Get a good mentor. Get some good advisors. You really do need, if you don't know too much about finance, to have people around you who can help you, advise you, and mentor you. And they will be absolutely invaluable. And by the way, angels are not always the best mentors. Um, not always. <laughs> they do have opinions. Mentors, <laughs> no, I'm a mentor and an angel. <laughs> I try to be a mentor, but not an, an, an angel mentor. It's a different kind of philosophy. Anyway, that's my time, and that's my little summary, and we'll talk later. All right. Um, this is uh, perfect. So the, our last panelist is a uh, guy, I guess, focuses on the later stage of these things. And so if you've made it into, into Sam Fazzelli's domain, you've probably been doing pretty well. He's a senior analyst and the EMEA, head of Bloomberg Intelligence, specializes in European pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. He has over 20 years of experience conducting equity research as a pharmaceutical analyst, working at firms such as uh, Numura, sorry, I screwed that up, International and HSBC. Prior to joining Bloomberg, uh, he worked at Piper Jaffray and uh, as a pharmaceutical analyst and a head of European research. Before transitioning to investment banking, he was a research scientist for seven years and has a PhD in pharmacology from the University of London. Take it Thank you. Um, so I'm, I feel a little bit like the odd, odd guy out here. You've got some extremely senior and, and fully involved people in terms of the investing world. And then there's me who's kind of, I always see myself as a ringside commentator. Everyone's in there throwing punches, trying to get drugs developed, and I'm just saying that's good and that's bad and that's good and that's bad. <laughs> and about 51% of the time right, which is just about the, the, the level that a good analyst gets, right? No, so I think I want to take my hat off to the chairman because whether he did it intentionally or not, he set this, this row up quite perfectly because I'm actually an angel and I do invest. It's been something that I've been allowed to do since about 2011 when I joined Bloomberg because they told me I cannot touch public equities. And I, you, know, you, you see something that's exciting, you want to invest in it. You see a company called Genmab in Denmark at 24 Danish krona, today is 923, you want to invest in it. But I can't. So they let me go and do some private investments. Um, what's interesting, of course, with all the conversations that I've heard here is that there is l very little mutual exclusivity between these avenues of funding. So um, an example is I've done three investments. I can't tell you if they're successful or not because these things take years. And one of them is, is, is a perfect model of how all of this fits together. A guy I knew, okay, he was an entrepreneur. He had made a company. He had sold it already. And I said to him, if you want to make a reversion of that, I'm interested. And he said, yes, okay. And they developed small molecules for respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. You probably know who this is. So we got involved at the ground level. So the idea was, let's go and just test some of these things in a lab, get some molecules. OK, who's going to fund that? Well, probably not a lot of people, because it's not, you can't go to a VC. Maybe you can. But in any case, what we did was put the 250,000 pounds in. Um, very few fr f uh, family, or no family, some friends, and quite a few fools, I think, too. Or perhaps, I don't know which one I belong to. So we did that. They got some hits, we did another round, they got some more hits, and the hit became really interesting looking, and then they went out and started looking for money from VCs. What we did then also is the 250,000 pound was used to leverage with some specialized type grants from 
um, Wellcome Trust. Um, and they, they would only invest if you've actually established a company. So then you get one and a half million pounds. It's not free money. It does get converted to equity. And at the end of the day, now we have a company that's $25 million, or oh, I can't remember if the number's right, 22 and a half, 24, I can't remember, invested by two VCs. And um, that's it. We're going to find out in the next year or two, maybe six months, whether those leads are actually relevant um, potential therapeutics. So all of this fit together quite nicely. And it's, as I said, it's interesting that I ended up at the, at the end of this. I know. I can't take credit for this, yeah. by the way. I, I'm just an opportunist uh, when I was... Uh, my, my other hat interest. that I wear is to analyze um, pharmaceuticals industry, the, the investing, the public investing, the billions of dollars that go into investments as opposed to millions of dollars, which is where you are at the beginning. Although I was just reading about um, a stem cell company that got invested for cancer therapy in the US, $500 million raised so far. And they call it a unicorn. I, I'm sure you know what it means, a unicorn, in the technology world. They're call it calling it a biotech unicorn because it's got a valuation of th over $3 billion. Um, stem center? Stem yeah. stem They're funded by things. the same guys who backed me, actually. Oh, that's right, that's enough. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. So there are, um, th those big money sometimes seem to happen in private investments too. But I think um, what's important is what, we, what I bring to the table with some, and I'm not advertising here, by the way, I've only got a little bit, bit of money. What I bring to the table is the fact that I've sat at the other end when you guys, companies, God willing, all of yours, are ready to go and pitch for an IPO. So I sit and listen to that, and I used to spend hours and days going through, um, uh, yeah, I can't remember what they were called now, the meetings that we had, the uh, kickoff meetings, I can't remember what they were called, t t two days locked in a room being educated or was it indoctrinated by the management of the company, telling you why their business is such a great thing and you should write a buy note on it. Or, but those, those were the days we used to be able to do that. So I've, I've seen the end result of that, and I can kind of um, backtrack and think, well, you're going to have to go through these processes. and get. There, there are many people who can do that. I just happen to be one of them. And, um, and I also have friends who've been entrepreneurs, so I can bring them into a story, saying, look, what do you think of this? One particular one with the one we were talking about in the room, I brought to one of the guys I know, and he's presented and, and brought some very interesting ideas. And all of this is pro bono, basically, until the day that you end up at a point that you need investment, then you look at it. So, nice uh, lineup. Well awesome. done. Thank you, guys. That, that, was, that was great. Um, now, I, uh, you know, I've been spending most of my life uh, from the kind of entrepreneurial scientists and uh, banging down this road, uh, but uh, we have an entire room full of brilliant young scientists here, and so uh, rather than just starting off q and I, I want to give as much time as possible to you guys, so do we have any questions uh, right now to get started? Perfect. Hi, thank you. Um, so once you decided to invest, uh, how do you decide to what extent you actually get involved do you, like, does it depend on the team or the project, the idea? Do you, do you would like to get involved in, 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 in the financing? Do you like to get involved in maybe also scientific questions? Can I, can I just say, there are stages, obviously, in the life of a company. And here in Cambridge, if you were two PhDs in a lab and you've got a great idea, you want to turn it into a company, you might start by coming to the accelerator at the Judge Business School. And you would say, we have this great idea, uh, and the accelerate management will look at your idea, and you may well get, if it's a good idea, then you have got the drive they think is necessary, you may well get accepted onto an acceleration program of three or six months. You will then find out whether you're really gonna do it at that time or not, and if you do it, you will go to a next stage and during that acceleration period, you will find mentors and you will be exposed to the earliest stage investors, the angels. So it often starts that way. And it often starts informally. I will get an email from a friend of mine in the computer lab who says, I've just met these crazy guys in uh, genomics. I don't know anything about it because I'm a computer scientist, but they've got a wonderful idea. Would you see them? So do your networking if you are very early stage, because it's the network 
that will introduce you to the channels where you can get good advice. The advice may be, don't do it yet. I've got a young lady who thought she could start a company with a new test for, a diagnostic test for cancer, and what we decided was she should do another year's research because she wasn't ready for that. So there's nothing more valuable than that early stage advisory network that will help you know if you're at a very early stage. And if you're beyond an early stage, you'll know something about what the other stages are. So um, just to add a very brief comment from a venture capital perspective. So the venture capitalist doesn't have the goal of getting involved with you. But that is something that we are very ready to do depending on what is the specific moment and specific need. Very clearly, as the example Professor Barrio was talking about, if, there are, if, if it's just a couple of young PhD scientists, which is fantastic for the vision of the company and, and the science behind the company, but of course, everything else, intellectual property, recruiting management team, all those kind of questions, it may be useful for the venture capitalists to really get involved uh, very closely with you to really get those things solved. And this is why I was saying earlier on that proximity for us is really very, very important, exactly because we are there to help, not because, uh, as you were saying, we are good people and nice people. No, no, it's in our interest that actually if we feel that you really need support in interviewing the right kind of people or having double checks on certain kind of people, then we are there uh, with the experience that we have matured over 20 years. But it's not the goal to really get involved and control how you think, how you do things. Just to add one sentence, here in Cambridge also we have a um, commercialization company in the university called Cambridge Enterprise which will do all the intellectual property management if they think you're worthy of that. They also have a seed fund and they now have a 50 million uh, innovation fund for long, longer term investing. Because most investments, my colleagues will agree, in your kinds of companies that you will form will be syndicated. Yeah. It's not likely that you're just going to end up with one investor. So again, it's getting on the trail, learning as you go, getting the right um, advice that, that will get you started. Yeah. And, and maybe if I can just add a couple of things there as well, just <coughs> to back those two things. Another thing to really reinforce mentors and people that can help you, you know, team up with somebody as soon as you can to, to really talk things through. Another program that um, I want to put out there is something that can really help you is something that SR1 runs with OBR, which is called One Start, which is an accelerator program. We run it every year. Um, it's focused on young people exactly like you. You have to be 35 or under to be in it. Uh, it's run like an accelerator program. We have a huge number of mentors from the industry, not just GSK, J&J, &J, BMS, Takeda. Uh, you get access to IP lawyers. You get access to lots of advisors. We have people who have been entrepreneurs. We have people who have been CEOs. We have executives of our companies that come to help us. And it's a great program, so you, you get onto that, you get uh, an idea of how to write a business plan, how to pitch, things to do, things not to do. And quite often it will be um, after that that people will go away. We, it is a competition, and if you win, you get £100,000, but it's not about the winning. It's about the number of companies which afterwards have actually managed to get follow-on funding <coughs> through leveraging their... Uh, network and the things that they've learned through the One Start program. So it's, it's starting yeah. to build up a great al alumni now. I'll say the credibility <coughs> that you get from these programs yeah. is huge. Is huge. Um, yeah. Did you have something to add? Yeah. So um, a couple of examples for you. I, I mean, obviously, I, I invest in things, again, as we were talking earlier. I try, anyway, in things that I understand and I like. <coughs> so one of my first companies was a diabetes company. Now, I just happened to have covered Novo Nordisk and, and uh, Eli Lilly for quite a few years. And I go to all the diabetes conferences. And so I've got a model for diabetes. I've got a model for insulin sales and this sales and that sales. I know what's going on in the early stages of development. So when this company wants to put a pitch together or a presentation together, I can give them tons of free data and information. And the way that they pitch it, I can say to them, you know what, maybe it's not a great idea to go after a biosimilar Lantus insulin because you know you're going to be fight, trying to convince people to invest in you and your competitors are Lilly and Sanofi. You really want to get into that game. Example. Another example is uh, with this particular company that actually is a one-star winner. I haven't done anything but we're talking. But I'm a neuroscientist and it's, it, to, I got to a point to almost feel that I could perhaps go and do some experiments in their lab for Saturday and Sunday <laughs> if I actually had the 
energy at the time. It's just exciting. So um, you get all kinds of levels of, of involvement. Uh, of course, VCs have their own. I, I will actually add to this. I think the uh, making friends with analysts and reporters can be incredibly valuable because they have a perspective that is, is very broad. And I, a lot of times I think it's a science to get into the weeds all the time. And you run into an analyst that, oh, I covered a company that did that and crashed like two years ago. Like, and that, it can save you an awful lot of pain and suffering to, to kind of leave your bubble a bit. And, and a lot of times they, they tend to be very willing to talk about this. I mean, so, uh, and, and they love to, to hear what's coming uh, down the road as well. Uh, I guess I'm trying to keep these answers to like five minutes so we can get through a whole bunch of them. Uh, you got a next question? Or? <laughs> we're, we're never going to get to it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Uh, who, uh, whoever, you can, the mic guys, you can operate these. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. I'm Professor Alan Berry, and I'm a uh, MPhil student doing um, bioscience enterprise here in Cambridge. Uh, so I want to take an example of Immunocore. So they're very successful now, and they're running from GSK, Eli Lilly, to like five years ago, they also experienced like VC funding pull out, but luckily a few private investors helped them passing through that tough period. So my question is, um, how can we actually ensure the money of the VC flowing to our business has a long-term commitment? And actually for VCs sitting here, what is the driving forces for you actually to de decide to um, pull out? So um, even though you haven't seen any like core IP of uh, the project you are investing? Well, it's, um, it's a rather brutal reality of life, mm. but if you don't succeed, uh, you don't go further. I mean, uh, so I, if I invest, will only pull out at an extreme situation. Why would I lose the money I've already invested? So the, 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 the reality is that you do have to have a good uh, product, a good technology, a good plan, a good team, and you have to show success. Uh, large numbers of companies don't succeed and they fail because they run out of money. That's the real reason for failure. So there's no easy answer to it. You just have to keep working on it. Uh, it did survive the company, did it? Or did yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so you got through it. But were the investors helpful to you at that time? The people who already had invested? Did they assist? They did, so they got involved. I mean, I, I've got a 14-year-old startup I'm working with at the moment that went into Death Valley and almost died and came out. Now it's just raised another four million, developed a new product, and it's alive again. Uh, there's no perfect or easy answer to your question, but if you've got good investors, generally, they should be supporting you because they don't want to lose their money. But unfortunately, though, that does lead to the walking dead. No, there's a TV yeah. series called Walking Dead. <laughs> Absolutely. Almost, so we have, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, quite a few. Now, the good thing with VCs is I think they're good at, very good at, identifying the Walking Dead. <laughs> and they kind of say, like, that's it. That's enough. It is not going to go anywhere. Like, we're just not going to mm. follow. The public market is a lot worse. It's, it's a lot less capable at that. They just, keep, they just keep raising a little bit. And I'm sure if we sat around a table in a Chatham house room, we're going to come up with a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> some, some nameless companies. Now, you are right. When I started my venture fund, one of the very uh, wonderful sage cornerstone investors said to me, one principle you must learn is, you know, if it doesn't look as if it's going to succeed, get out early. And, and another way of looking at how one takes decisions in investing is I always have a principle when people come to me looking for money, uh, a similar principle where I say I want to avoid the slow no. Because if you're trying to get money and people are keeping you waiting three months, six months and the valuation's going down, I'm sure we're going to get onto valuation right. later. We won't talk about it now. But so, so trust, honesty, reality, yeah, you must know if you're running something that isn't going to succeed. The, you must know. Yeah. A lot of times the, the VCs, uh, not all of them, of course, but uh, some of them, they like to starve you because they know, like, uh, time is not on your side. If you, you have a, a splatter date ahead of you and uh, they seem kind of interested, if you come back a little bit later and have no money, it's probably not going to go well for you. And so uh, I, I found it, it's much better to, uh, to try to keep them on edge um, and, and not get in that spot. But... Um, can I just say one more quick thing? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you all understand the difference in mentality between an angel and a VC? 
You're yeah. looking, you're looking at me. Yeah. 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 yeah, you do, you do. <laughs> but do they, do they? No, exactly, no, you were looking at me. You might want to say something about that. Yeah. Is there a difference? What's the difference? If I'm an angel and I invest, or he's a VC and invest, is our mentality different? Why would it be different? Whose money am I investing? We'll, we'll leave this as an exercise to yeah. the audience for later. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> in the interest of getting through this huge uh, pile of questions we have. Uh, the next one. Hi, my name is Alice Nettleton. Um, I was wondering about the valuation, actually, and how much evaluation of a, um, especially early stage companies um, affects your investment decisions, because it's quite difficult to in, um, to value early stage technology, so how do you decide which companies to invest in? For, for 42. 42. <laughs> 42. <laughs> what? 42. Yeah, so I, I, it's, a, it's a very interesting and it's a dilemma. Um, the way we look at it is we take a pragmatic view at it. I'm sure F Sam can tell you about discounted cash flows and all sorts of things that people can do. There's lots of things you can do. For me, it's pointless doing that. In, in the stage that we invest, we, we invest very early. What we're thinking about is what, not what you're valued now, but what you're going to be here when you've grown into something really, really interesting. And we look at those numbers. We look at what's happening in the world out there. We take our own experience. We look at our own portfolio. We see what's happened. We look at data from the VC world. We look at... Uh, <coughs> what numbers uh, the big pharma companies are buying things for, what sort of deals are being done out there. And we think about that, and we think what it's going to take to get your company to here, and how much it's going to cost to get your company there. And then we work backwards, and we say, well, that means if we've got to put this amount of money in, and we need to make a return on that amount of money to get us up here, then your valuation's here. So it's not an exact science at all. Some people spend a very, very long time looking at it and thinking about it. But that's the basics of how certainly we and I think the, the yeah. venture world does it. I mean, do you agree with that, Francesca? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say that at early stage, and we're talking just about startup levels kind of companies, we do not invest on the basis of evaluation. Yeah. It's not too expensive to invest. So we've never, over 20 years, passed on, in, on an investment because of, because of the valuation because it's so randomly, almost, I don't want to be too much, too reductionist, but it's almost randomly connected with the outcome. The outcome is going to be anywhere between 10 billion and a write-off. So if you take that as a real assumption, then what valuation are you going to pay right now? So there are really two dimensions that we, instead of valuation, we look at to really decide if we invest or not. As Debbie was saying, is really the value proposition of the idea. Is this a big idea? Is not a big idea? Is this going to be really important? With all the technology risk that needs to be taken, right? So we take very, with, with pleasure, we take technology risk, but as the only risk that we want to take. And then the second dimension is how much cash is, we call it the cash distance to the proof of concept, so how much cash is needed to get there. And it's not at the million dollar levels. Is it half a billion? Is it 100 million? Is it 20 million? That is the order of, of definition, right? So you understand that it's not really mathematics or financials. Is more a, a general assessment of things. I, I think that's great advice. I, I often refer to valuations as voodoo, and uh, I think that really the perspective you need to keep in mind is is how much money are you going to need to get to your milestones, and how much are you going to pay for that. And mm -hmm. so it, it's like you're going to give up basically the same amount no matter how much you're raising in each round. And so it, it's important to just make sure you can meet your milestones. And I, I would dwell less on the valuation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question in the middle here. Yeah, sorry. I, uh, get the, one of the microphones. Sorry. Um, hi, my name's Angela. Um, I'm a practicing doctor in New Zealand, um, and I've also co-founded a company on supporting um, innovation in large healthcare organizations. Um, living in New Zealand, we are geographically isolated. Um, we're a small country of five million, and it's very concerning when I hear um, what Dr. Francesco says, that proximity is really important, because we have no real um, sources of funding that we're nearby to, um, which is actually, um, despite our really um, uh, innovative spirit, we don't have the funding in terms of the scale of funding we need, um, or even the ris risk appetite. And it's a twofold question. One is, how can we um, have channels to international fundings to come to New Zealand? Um, how would you support that? And how can we create our own 
um, funding pools um, the same way that we see in the US. If I may, I'd like to generalize that question a little bit uh, as well, and that we have 42 countries represented here, and this is a problem that will repeat itself over and over. So how, uh, even from the abstract sense, how do you go about this? Uh... Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, and I'm sorry that I really uh, hammered on proximity is really important because it's true that I don't have easy solutions. I love rugby, so that is really a good tool. Yeah, I could go, but I'm not going to be venture capital, right? It's good, just, you just won. So it is a, it is a, 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 a big issue, uh, which is also represents the opportunity at the same time. Even in Switzerland, Actelion was referred to some time ago as a spin-off of Roche. It was not a spin-off of Roche. It was, despite Roche, it was created. So I'm sure that we will get into discussions. <laughs> we will get into discussions there. Um, but, right, so it was people that left Roche and tried to pull away some molecules with a lot of effort. But anyway, so what Actelion did for Switzerland was that with the successful example that they brought to the Swiss markets, of course the Swiss markets were sophisticated already because of course Roche, Novartis were there, uh, but there were no startups really. So Actelion was the first example of saying, oh my God, actually we can create a startup from scratch and become successful in timelines which are sort of fun, right? It's not 25 years before you are successful, but it's something which, more compa which is more compatible. On the back end of that, that was December 98, on the back end of that, what happened is that several other uh, managers from pharmaceutical companies, startup entrepreneurs, biologists, very young people like yourselves, started thinking, oh my God, this can be great. We can create our own startups. And since then, since 98, because of this break that there was in the Swiss market, an enormous amount of startups and biotech companies got created in, in, in the area, which basically meant that also a lot of other venture capitalists you know, started to, to, to come around to, to, to Switzerland. Of course, Switzerland was not as remote as New Zealand from a European perspective, right? So it was easier to go from London to Geneva. But, but at the same time, there is really the need of a break. Now, specifically, honestly, uh, you know, I, I do not know how to fix the solution, but clearly it is very important to really think about an ecosystem because if there is one missing component, for example, and then I will shut up. For example, in, in Switzerland, um, on, so the, every, every region has got, is the center of the world, right? Geneva thinks that they are the center of the world for biotech pharmaceuticals, but there is no pharmaceutical companies in Geneva, right? There is none. So when it's a matter of cre attracting people that have pharmaceutical skills, they all want to go to Basel, which is where the pharmaceutical companies. Yes. Now, Basel and Geneva are 200 kilometers away, 250. So you will consider it's the same place. Uh, they are very, very different, right? It's very, very different to hire people into Geneva if they are based in Basel. Yeah. So the ecosystem means that you really need to have components of every single aspect. So, um, you know, it's not really just attracting venture capital to, to a place, but there also need to be people that have the right competence in terms of pharmaceutical, in terms of biotech. Mm -hmm. And I do not know what is the, the, easy, the easy formula, but that is something that we find it challenging mm -hmm. as venture capital firms to be helpful at such a, a big distance. See, from an entrepreneur's perspective, get some frequent flyer miles. Like most of my money doesn't come from where we're based. And, uh, and as much as everyone, yeah, it's way better if you're based over there. Uh, at some point you have to go to where the food is. And uh, so get, spend some time getting over there. If you can sell someone on the idea and that your team is in place, you have a lot better chance uh, of getting them if you're there in their office than if you're uh, calling them from New Zealand. And so, I mean, I, with the tech space in Silicon Valley, they've gotten to the point where if you show up and are sleeping in your car out there, they look at that as a good thing. And uh, I, I think bio's not quite there. But, uh, but basically, you're going to have to go to them. I, I, I don't think you'll ever be able to get them to come over to you. I, I mean, that's a problem for a, another conference, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the ecosystem. Think about ecosystems. You know, this is a small city with a huge cluster of technology companies. So, okay, we're near other things but it's small. Think of Israel. Israel's a very interesting example of a smaller country that's developed a wonderful high-tech cluster, uh, including bioscience, because the ecosystem has been developed. Now, the other thing I would say, all of the entrepreneurial surveys I read indicate that New Zealand has the most entrepreneurial or amongst the most entrepreneurial people when they do these surveys in the world. So I agree that you're going to have to find a way mm -hmm. of growing something locally there. Mm -hmm. And I do think it would be possible. All right, next question. Uh, right there. Thank 
Lenia Swenda from Medicines for Africa. I realize a lot of the discussion that we are having here is relevant for product development. But what aspects of, of, of the advice that you've been given would also be relevant for entrepreneurs who are operating downstream of product development? So where you're trying to get products to patients, for instance, would it be different or, you know, or would it be the same? Thank you. I'm not quite sure right. I fully so, understand. So, so I think services, services. Yeah. services, technology, diagnostics, it's definitely not an area I know much about. Yeah. I would say, you know, if I can take a, a stab at this, I, I would say um, uh, without having specific knowledge of the specifics, but the general rules that can apply always, um, you know, from this kind of investment approach to uh, later stage development is really uh, the choice of the backers, whatever the financial backers, whatever is the kind of financial backers, has to be really matched with the strategy. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. A venture capital firm, and I talk about myself, of course, I love my venture firm, every venture firm has got a different strategy, but in general, or let's say my venture firm would not invest in general on service-based companies. The reason for that being, so for example, you know, um, other, other, other investment models other than investing on molecules, that is something that we do not do really, simply because of scalability of the model. To, to, to get $2 of outcome, you need to invest $2 of inputs. So it's two to two, it's one to one, it's linear in the, in the, in the service business models or in, I was discussing with, with another uh, you know, young entrepreneurs earlier. Um, it's, it's very difficult to really justify, remember that we have to have a capitalistic perspective. If I know that I can put my dollar there and scale the return on that dollar much more quickly, that is something that I need to do, not because I'm greedy, but because I'm evaluated in a few years from my own investors in my own fund that will say, we gave you one dollar, all your competitors make ten dollars out of that one dollar, why did you put, why did you do two dollars only? Because I invested in a in an linearly scalable business, that is not something that they want to hear. So that is a little bit of a challenge for venture capital to look at business models which are not molecule focused or, 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 or drug focused. Uh, this is a general rule of thumb with the VCs, if you can't make 10 to 1 on your investment, they're not going to talk mm -hmm. to you. Um, and partly because they, uh, most of their investments don't succeed. So their fund has to be covered by the ones that do. And so if you can't make enough money to effectively cover their fund, they're probably not going to take the risk on it. And so I think you, you need to look for people who are OK with that class of investment. It's probably not going to be venture capital. Mm -hmm. Let, let me just say, though, that there is a lot of money these days going into digital healthcare, for example. Digital healthcare, where there is scalability, where you can get market share quickly with something that is service based but is digital. And I've invested in digital healthcare for sure. A lot of people around here are coming forth with digital companies, but I'm not sure whether that was the kind of thing you had in mind. Uh, uh, next question, is the mic's been keeping track of these guys? <laughs> I, I can only see, I get some of them, but go, go ahead, whoever you saw. Um, my name is Ayan, and I'm an undergraduate biomedical sciences student. I'm also a co-founder of a pretty young startup. We're only, we've only been working for 10 years, I mean 10 months. <laughs> <laughs> That's half my life. <laughs> and my question is more so, when do you know that you're ready to sort of uh, seek out um, a different funding sources? Like, we hear a lot, you're a young company, slow down, you, you know, you might not be ready to go to the yet. When do you know that you're ready, and also what sources should you kind of try and access first? Thank you. Well, can I just ask a question back at you? Who's telling you that you're young and to... Oh, so we're part of um, an incubator at our right. university, and we have a mentor, and... Um, as you can imagine, like young startups were very excited, so we're like, we have this idea, and people are excited. We're going to go talk to VCs, and they're like, sit down, right. you know, stay where you are. So. Well, I think that probably comes back to, to your advice, Alan. You know, if, they're, if they're experienced people and they're telling you that, they're telling you that for a reason, right? And one of the things, I think, one of the themes you're hearing from a lot of the, all of us, really, is sometimes, don't be too eager, don't come out too soon. We quite often um, will be meeting people one, two years before we'll make an investment. And sometimes we say to them, just go back and do this little bit extra. Find the killer thing. Find that killer experiment and do it. And if you can do a set of killer experiments without taking 
somebody like our money or Francesca's money, our, ex our money is expensive. It's a, the cost of money is another thing. Don't do it. And if there are things that you can do that test your hypothesis early and give you a stronger package to come out to somebody like us with, do it and be a little bit patient. Um, it, is really, it is really important to listen to that advice. Um, you can always get a second opinion. You can always come and find a friendly VC through one of these programs, through one of these accelerator programs, through one start, through something else, and just talk to somebody, talk to one of us and say, what about this, what about that, this is where we are. Um, that's what we do with a lot of our companies on one start, and a lot of them don't then seek funding for another two or three years. So you can get advice, um, and you can access people uh, through things like this. My advice would be to find somebody, get somebody to introduce you. Cold calls are never good. Find somebody who knows somebody. It's all about network. It's all about, um, you know, Alan was saying this earlier, it, just build up your knowledge base and build up your network. Get the advice. Get somebody to introduce you to somebody else, a VC. And if you really want to do it, have a go and but sound out your idea. There's a young lady here you should talk to. Fiona, are you here? Yeah, Fiona Nielsen was in this position a couple of years ago. We had a long talk about it. You should talk. We, won't, we haven't got time to talk about the detail. Mm -hmm. She will tell you that if you've got serious doubts about starting a business, you, should, you will not do not it. Do it. And you shouldn't do it. Yeah. But Fiona was where you are, and she's now got a thriving company uh, in the in the DNA area. So, mm -hmm. and and again, it's not a product company; it is an information service company, which comes back to your question. Don't miss meeting Fiona while you're here. Yeah, I, w I would also say that when uh, when I was starting out and we got our first bit of proof of concept data, I went down to Silicon Valley, the closest pot of money to me. And I uh, lined up a bunch of meetings and said, hey, I'm not looking to raise money right now, but I want to hear what you think about this. And, uh, and partly because you get all your connections that way, and they start to watch you. And mm -hmm. investors like to see that you follow through on things. And uh, it takes forever to raise money. And, uh, and so figure out what they think the problems are early. And if you just say, hey, I'm not looking for money right now, they'll, <laughs> VCs do not want to miss out on the next big thing. They, they're going to talk with you, almost certainly. Uh, they might tell you you're crazy. But, uh, but figure this out, um, and I would definitely just, just set expectations properly. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, oh, there's more. Uh, hi there, my name is Raphael Chow. I work as a strategy consultant at Monitor Deloitte in London. So I just wanted to go back to a graph that Sophie showed this morning, which is uh, that more and more money is being poured into pharmaceutical R&D, but we're seeing fewer, less returns as a result uh, still. How has VCs, how has the behavior of VCs changed given this trend? What is the strategy for investment at the moment? How are you countering this? Can you give some specifics around disease areas are you investing in perhaps, or maybe the stage of investment? Are you, where is VC money flowing? I would first of all say I don't think for us it's about uh, disease areas. It's about innovation. So it's about novelty. It's about things that are really going to change the, the way patients are treated and the way prescribers prescribe or the way payers think about the, uh, the value of medicines. That's what it's about. And from, you know, I can say a little bit from being, having been on the inside looking out and now being on the outside looking in, you know, pharma R&D, they can't do everything. They've got a budget as well. And they invest in the things that uh, are probably going to make sense for them at least over the next three to five years. And v certainly from our perspective at SR1, I think also from Francesca's at Medici, we're thinking probably a bit longer than that. We're thinking what's going to be the step change? What's going to be the thing that's really going to have that aha moment? Um, so it's not about therapeutic areas. It's not about uh, you know, following a trend. It's about thinking beyond that trend. It's about thinking what's going to be big next. And there's risk in that. There's a lot of risk in that. And as Francesca said, we'll quite happily take that technology risk, but that's the only risk we want to take. So I think that, they, that we are looking at now a lots of ways to invest early but get to the quick no. And certain firms do it in different ways. So that's something that maybe we can explore a little bit if people are interested in, in how, to, how we do that. I think different firms do it in different ways. And as Alan said, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, 
when you need a critical mass of funding, we syndicate everything. So we're taking out a little bit of the financial risk by syndicating. Sometimes you don't, depending on the type of business model you have, but mostly you do in, what, in big technology plays that need significant amounts of money. So I think that the difference that uh, early stage VC investing is making, or has made over the last few years, perhaps since 2008, 9, 10, is that we are taking a lot more early stage innovation biology technology risk. That's what we're doing, irrespective of therapy area. Francesca? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. agree. I totally agree. So there is not really a lot of um, evolution in mm -hmm. business models. It's maybe the, the companies that are not clear, going, they're not clearly going to win. Mm -hmm. We may have a tougher attitude on mm -hmm. them. So if anything, we take more, you know, more likely than before the false negative risk. So mm -hmm. uh, stopping investing in a company yeah. that maybe could have, uh, you know, come back to resurrection. Um, basically, the dollars we, we prefer, um, you know, leave dollars that we've invested in the first place. So, sunk costs are mm -hmm. something that we need to forget about, and we just look at the future dollars that we're going to invest to really make the decision. So, the attitude is probably going, has probably changed a little bit because there is not really an easy way out if uh, if things don't you know don't look perfect. Mm -hmm. I think I don't know whether my colleagues agree with this, but. I would say that also the very early stage funding situation has improved a lot in the last yes, five to yes. 10 years, which means that the VCs are seeing more things that have been validated than they were before. And if you look at crowdfunding, there's one particular hybrid a company called Syndicate Room here that only crowdfunds for companies that have already got 25% of their equity promised by angels. And, and Syndicate Room works with the angels. So you have a new hybrid model that's coming forth that enables at the very early stage companies to get maybe a million or two and therefore show the VCs in a little bit further down the road that their investors can benefit from investing in their company. Can I ask a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do the VCs think about, I mean, I know that it, it, it often is the opposite direction where angels get a bit frustrated with some of their ratchets and preference shares that VCs want, <laughs> but that's mostly because they don't understand that $25 million has a price, because yeah. there's no other way of doing it. <clears throat> um, but what about the other way around? How frustrated or how much of an impact does it have on your decision, whether to look at a company or not? Whether they're angel funded, so let's say there's five or 10 people, mm -hmm. and then worse still, or potentially better still, whatever the way you want to look at it, Angel funded and crowd funded with God knows how many shareholders. <clears throat> uh, the answer is I don't know because I've not been in the crowdfunding space, but I, I, I look at complexity. Complexity is one reason why we may not do something. And complexity of, of shareholder structure is something that you've got to think about going forward. So if there are, I'm sure there are ways to deal with that. Uh, and if there are ways to deal with that and the idea is good and the people are good, well, then you'll find a way. One simple way is that most crowd funders are nominee based systems. So there is a nominated mm -hmm. person or group that represents so they 50 are, investors. So they're represented as one shareholder? Yeah. yeah, most of the US ones yeah. aggregate yeah. them and yeah. turn nominated. LLC, so there's yeah. only one. But I've never yeah. done one. Have you done one, Francesca? No, 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 no I have not done one. Uh, I don't think it would be a major technical mm -hmm. issue, but it's, uh, it's probably um, unlikely that we would do this because we really create, you know, we really yeah. want to get involved from the get-go. Yeah. Um, usually we are, instead of angels, um, not because we don't like angels, we love angels, <laughs> but it's just because usually uh, we really interact directly with the scientists and then we had to go back to CE, to Cambridge Enterprise, to convince them mm -hmm. to do the company. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, um, but usually if there is already a crowdfunded kind of company, mm -hmm. we must have heard about this or if we have not done the deal beforehand, there must be I mean, one some local bioscience company, Axol Biosciences, just raised more than a million through syndicate room crowdfunding with angels beside it. These guys are giving you the answer to my question. Mm. What's the difference in the mindset mm. between an angel and a VC? I'm investing my own money. Mm. That's all I need to think about. Mm. VCs are investing other people's money. They're mm. charged with getting them a return. So mm. it's a different mm. mindset. Yeah. It's a family offices are another animal to tackle, which oh, yeah. I guess we can get into later, but uh, I think very much worth considering, especially in the US. I saw there's a couple questions up front here, a couple hands that have been uh, hanging around. Oh. I just, I, 
I had a comment from the other side. I sat on both sides, both as an angel and obviously as an entrepreneur and builder. And I think one, one thing that hasn't been mentioned here is relationship with shareholders. Mm -hmm. And I think there that, you know, having come out of Death Valley, uh, what brought us out of Death Valley is honesty with shareholders. We always work on a mantra that give good news fast and bad news faster. And then your shareholders know exactly where you are and you give them the tools to decide on an honest basis whether to continue funding or to walk away. That's yeah, essential. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, hi. Um, I'm currently developing uh, my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging. Uh, my name is Victor. And I have a question that is somewhat related to what uh, Dr. Sam just mentioned. And is, uh, let's pretend that I'm coming to you looking for fund. But I've, in the past, I've already funded one or two companies that have failed. Would that be a reason not to fund a company? Or yeah. is Perhaps that? Perhaps the opposite. Perhaps the yeah, opposite. Yeah. If you understand why you failed and you've learned from why you failed, that's what we'll be looking for. Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> Learning from failures. Actually, yes. Learning from failure is very important, and why you failed, it's like we were talking about earlier. If you, one of the reasons that, and I'm sure Francesca and his team do this, when you look at some science, you look for the killer experiment. You say, what is the thing that I can do actually that will disprove my hypothesis and or give me the reason to believe? And if you failed because you've done the right experiment and it just hasn't panned out, that's absolutely fine. And then you've learned from that and you've, learnt, you've built people around you that help you mitigate some of that risk, then that's not a reason not to invest. I've had not six failures. I've had six failures. And remember what Edison said after taking 30 years to develop the electric light bulb mm. and people criticised him? He said, I have not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that didn't work. <laughs> now, you don't want to find 10,000 yeah. ways that didn't work. Failure yeah. is learning. But if yeah. you treat it right. And, and also, look, one of the other things in our business, look at pharma, look at biotech, look at the failure rate. You know, so certainly in drug discovery, you should almost, it's a horrible thing, you should expect to fail. In fact, it's more likely you will fail than you will succeed if you're in the drug discovery and development business. I'd say as a scientist and entrepreneur, like a good skill is to learn how to kill your baby as quickly yeah. as possible. The, uh, I mean, you're young, you got your life ahead of you. If, if this idea is going down, bury it um, and move on to the next thing. And uh, I mean, time is the one thing you don't want to waste. And uh, so I, I actually have gotten far more aggressive with my own ideas. And like, I, I want to have them destroyed long before someone else finds a hole <laughs> I haven't found. In a so one comment that I wanted to add also for the question that was a few questions earlier um, for the 10 years old startup, um, an idea usually does not get better with time. In other words, what I'm saying is that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The more data you have, the worse it gets. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if you're not fully, it's, it looks like you are fully convinced about, about your idea. But so just know that this is the top of the quality of your idea, because you will learn more and more. Mm -hmm. Most of the times, what you learn simply because it's the nature of the, of the beast, right? That is much more outside of you than, than within your company. So the more you grow, the more time passes, the more the idea will be limited, mm -hmm. will become <coughs> confined, more confined. It could still be a, a, a fantastic idea, but this is the, the biggest moment. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that if you're not, so to start up a business, you really need to be really very excited about the business, really, really very excited. And actually, that is also the strength and the limitation of the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is myopically thinking that his or her idea is the best ever. If it was not the case, who would really go into that pain of creating a company against the odds, against the world, against everybody else, you know, going to go to venture capital to talk to them? That's really a lot of pain. So the entrepreneur must be really convinced. That is the strength of the entrepreneur, the myopic conviction. That is also its weakness, right? That will not listen to when background noise or external inputs are saying, you know what, there is another DNA sequencing technology which is happening there. You know, have you put that into context? But the idea is going to be confined as you grow. So um, it's just to say it starts at the best and then it gets confined a little bit. I don't mean to break dreams because still, it can be a fantastic idea, but just, you know, conviction at the beginning is really key. Hi, I'm Alberto, PhD in neurobiology. I work in Basel. Uh, I'm wondering, you are uh, 
an information hub. Uh, you go around, you know what, you, you want to know what everybody's doing to choose the best ideas. How safe are we scientists in talking to you about our very early stage ideas? <laughs> Depends if you're the talking to, to um, who? Yeah. To the wolves and the hen house. We're safe. We're safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have to. I'm, I'm very safe. I'm very safe. No. no so, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So, um, of course, and this is a fair question. Yeah. And it's a question that is the first, probably the first question that you ask yourself yeah. when you start saying, okay, I need to, to, to talk to these people. So, um, uh, first of all, there is a, a good faith kind of understanding at the very beginning, but don't go on good faith because venture capitalists are not all good, right? Here, the two here are perfect, but, <laughs> but not all are like the two of us, right? So, uh, you really need to, to, to get covered. First of all, there is intellectual property. So, in the moment in which you've got intellectual property, there is some disclosure that you can do to a certain extent. But secondly, and this is the most important news, is that most of the times you don't need to disclose confidential information for us to get a sense on whether or not we are serious or we're not serious. Sure. So we will sign confidentiality agreement uh, once we really get downstream in the due diligence. Now remember, we see approximately, I, I think more or less for you the same, about 2,000 deals every yeah. year, which means 200 every month, which basically means 50 every week, yeah. 10 every day, right? So we're not going to sign 10 CDAs, confidential agreement every day. But it's also true that of those 2,000 a year, we'll probably go into the due diligence on a very small minority because 1,500 of those, just by the profile matching that we do of them, the opportunity is, is in the wrong geographic area. New Zealand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. But, or, or it's in the wrong business model, service business yeah. model. So yeah. there is profile matching. We don't need to sign confidentiality agreements. Yeah. Now, for, for us to get that information, we, you don't need to give us any confidential information other than your big vision. Presentations that we were given this morning, they were perfect. We got a sense of what they're doing. Who is of us interested in the specifics will be able to approach. At one moment, you will need to sign a confidentiality agreement to be protected, of course. In the moment in which you get an, a CDA signed, then we cannot do anything bad, even if we would really like to do it. But we cannot do anything bad. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of early entrepreneurs make this mistake yeah. of being too guarded with their ideas, and it hurts them partly because they don't get the negative feedback when people say, hey, that's stupid. Yeah. Um, also, uh, it, people tend to, I think, interpret it as being inexperienced. And so, like, I mean, when, when these guys uh, want to dig into you, you get the rubber glove treatment. It's hundreds of pages of due diligence. And so, and under that, you're under CDA. But if you can't articulate what you're doing and why they should give you money in a few minutes and, mm -hmm. and not be really in big trouble, uh, you, you've done something wrong, I think. I, okay, so we have less than a minute now. I don't, uh, can, we, can we do one more fast? Or? Was one other question. Is there, yeah, all right, we'll do one more. Go at the back end. In the back, all right. <coughs> I'll try not to keep everyone from lunch. Yeah. It's a 75 minute session, we, I know, I feel tired. I'm just sitting here. <laughs> so my question comes back to alternative funding and equity crowdfunding, because I think it's really, really interesting, because you open up a whole new pool of capital but you open it up to investors who are not subject matter experts, right? Mm -hmm. So this could be your average person. And these biotech ventures are often very complex. So, so how do you address that? How do you tackle that? Because on Kickstarter, you might understand what an electrical bike is going to do, and you feel comfortable investing in it, but how are you going to make the average person understand and invest to make the equity funding platform really work? But, you know, in the end, I, I agree. I agree with you. But in the end, it's a manageable risk. Right? From a venture capital perspective, whether or not there is crowdfunding there, as long as there is one person, one vote, one nominal yeah. representative, that is manageable, right? And depending on what kind of, what is the equity ownership in the company, that is, that is fine. But I agree with you, so it's manageable, but I agree with you that it's not something that I really can understand uh, how it can well, work. Well, well let, me, let me tell you that the equity crowdfunders like Syndicate Room, which does mostly technology, their crowd are smart investors. They're the okay. smart investors who are all over the country, but not here. So usually they are smart investors, and they're declared they're smart investors. But Syndicate Room has now got an intermediary position. Uh, it's negotiated with the stock exchange. So if it takes a company to the public market that it's crowdfunding as well, and they've done it, then the general public can join in in the retail share ownership. The, um, the, the, the question, I, I guess the other angle to think about is that when Francesco or, or <coughs> that would take a company to, um, to the market, 
you will be in bed with a bunch of retail investors. You can't, that, that's the day that you have no more choice yeah. about it. So uh, it, actually I think that's potentially even worse, worse. Yeah. than when yeah. you have a yeah. nominee. Yeah. So, but in terms of getting the information to those people, smartness is one thing. Yeah. I'm assuming that most of these places, at least in the angel world, you get angels involved in one of these investors. You know, one guy is a shipping guy. So he just knows that I th seem to, th to know what I'm talking about. So he kind of follows. So he, it's much the same as it VCs is. get lead investors uh, and others follow. In so syndicate they room, they're only investing in companies where smart angels are leading right. the investment round. So they either, the other smart investors or semi-smart investors, take the word of the core angels that the due diligence has been done and invest, or they don't. All right, well, let's wrap it up then. Thank you guys very much. That was a, that's awesome.